Welcome back to the Authentic On Air with Bruce Alexander. Today's show is brought to you by my new digital course, Nine Ways for the ADHD Dad to Radically Improve Communication. Do you ever struggle to communicate with your spouse or your family in a way that feels meaningful? Have you found yourself consistently taken advantage of at work and in your personal life because no one seems to care how it affects you? If that sounds familiar, then you have a communication problem. ADHD or not, dad or not, if you are not able to identify, define, and communicate what is important to you with authority and intention, you will continue to struggle. I know that from experience. If you can't communicate what matters to you, it is almost impossible to do anything that matters. The Nine Steps for the ADHD Dad to Radically Improve Communication is a self-paced digital course that will guide you to reclaiming the power of your voice to speak the life you deserve into existence. It's available at www.authenticidentitymanagement.com forward slash nine steps hyphen special offer. For a limited time, not only can you get this course at a special limited time price that you need to see to believe, but I'm also throwing in some really valuable bonus materials completely free of charge. Again, for a limited time, not only will you get the course at a special low price, but you will get all the following completely free. Access to the ADHD Dad's private community where I post live content daily the impactful audio lesson, the 10 hacks for the ADHD dad to thrive in the workplace, access to the passion, purpose, and self-acceptance video collection featuring Jim Rohn, Jordan Peterson, and Garrett J. White, a digital download of the powerful Unmasking ADHD Blueprint, and for the cost of shipping and handling only, an exclusive ADHD dad t-shirt so you can represent your allegiance to that ADHD dad life. That is all available at www.authenticidentitymanagement.com forward slash nine steps hyphen special offer. Again, that is www.authenticidentitymanagement.com forward slash nine steps hyphen special offer. You can also just click the link in the show notes and now back to the regular. Hello and welcome back to Authentic on Air with Bruce Alexander. I am your host, Bruce Alexander. Do I have a treat for the authentic audience today? I say channeling a 1960s grandmother. I'm a little giddy to sit down with stand-up comedian and legend of the Kill Tony podcast, Celia Contreras. <laughs> More about Celia after today's reflection. Today, I'm, ex- I'm asking listeners to explore the potential rewards of putting it all out there. What would it look like if everything went right? If you were to disassemble any facade you have been hiding behind, can you imagine what the best possible result would be? This is the way I have embraced living, why I'm an authenticity coach, and why I make this show for you to hear. I am literally betting my life on the power of putting it all out there. What I have found is that my dreams weren't big enough. The acceptance I have found when I have given others a chance to meet me where I am has really blown my mind. The opportunities I have found, the purpose I have felt since embracing my authentic self has only propelled me further into this journey for authenticity because it just feels right. I would love to hear what you, what experience you have had with putting it all out there. Tell me if you have found what I have or not. Go to the at Authentic Identity Management episode 28 reflection post on Instagram, Facebook, threads, or LinkedIn, and let me know what is stopping you from putting it all out there. If you are struggling with where to start, type potential in the comments, and I will reach out to you and set up a free 30-minute consultation to see how I can help you start putting it all out there and reaping the benefits of your authentic life. If you love the space we are creating on this podcast, or just want to help advance my mission of making the world a safer place for authenticity, Here are a few ways you can help support this show. Leave a review and tell me what you think is great, needs work, or you would like to see more of in the show. Follow the show on your favorite podcast platform or all the platforms you use. Use that share function. Send an episode of this show to someone you care about or post about it on your social media feeds and in your stories. Those are all free ways to to promote the authentic mission. If you aren't comfortable being a spokesperson for authenticity, you can be a financial backer of the Authentic Mission by going to Patreon and searching Authentic on Air with Bruce Alexander and signing up for a membership. I am dedicated to the work of this mission long term, but I would love your help in making more quickly the world a safer place to show up as yourself. I have become a huge fan of this podcast called Kill Tony. It is the number one live podcast in the world, and I and much of the time it is everything that this podcast is not. Crass, unforgiving, harsh, and insensitive but there are times when it is everything I want this show to be. Let me back up and provide a little more background on the structure of the show. 
The show's main host, comedian Tony Hinchcliffe, and his producer partner, Brian Redband, set up in front of a live audience and allow any person who has the desire to sign up for one minute of uninterrupted comedy, followed by an interview. The names are dropped into a bucket, pulled at random, and merged with a sprinkling of weekly regulars. The hosts are joined by two or three guests who provide commentary throughout the night's entertainment. The bucket is filled with names that range from veteran comics to immature time wasters who don't comprehend the opportunity to people praying that this is the shot they need to take them from homelessness to stardom. What I really love so much about Kill Tony is that it is that shot. Tony is a total savage. He will tear you apart unless one of two things are true. You are hilarious or you are honest. If you blow your one minute of stand up, you have a chance to make an impression during the interview. And the thing that holds true in both is authenticity wins. In that rare instance, when someone brings it all together and uses their own story to make people laugh, makes deep, authentic connection through honesty, and makes everyone who is listening pay attention and care. Celia Contreras is that person. I was watching an episode and working, laughing when appropriate, but not really connecting, until a bucket pool was announced as a Kill Tony legend, and that perked me up a bit. Before the jokes, or before the jokes start, I just want to say, if you are out there and you have a disability, don't let it stop you from being the type of person you want to be. This was followed by a hilarious joke that I will encourage the audience to search YouTube for the video to hear. But in that moment, she had me. I could feel the sincerity, and I was along for the ride for, the, for a hilarious minute. What made, this, <clears throat> sorry, what made all of this extraordinary was the interview. Standing there in front of Roseanne Barr, David Koechner, Tony Hinchcliffe, and hundreds of comedy fans, Celia bared her soul and shared her story. The result left me in tears and on a mission to secure an interview. I was ready to go to extreme lengths to get a sit down with this astonishing human being. That was not required. I literally just commented on a Facebook post and sent a DM on Instagram and Facebook. And here we are less than a week later, face to face for a conversation. I am happy to welcome to the show, Celia Contreras. Welcome, Celia. How's it going? It's going really good. I'm so glad we were able to connect and I was able to get you on my show. I feel like this is a big deal. I don't, maybe it's not too. Oh no, like I'm excited. I'm like, it's good for me to be doing stuff. I just got out of a, de a depressive episode. So I've kind of just been like laying in bed, staring at the ceiling a lot. I'm, I'm glad that you have taken this time to step outside of that and, and help me share your story because I think it really is an amazing one. But before we get too deep into that experience, can you tell me, or to tell the audience who you are in your own words, how you spend the majority of your time, and why you came on the show today. Um, yeah, my name is Celia Contreras. I've been doing stand-up comedy for the past seven years. I, um, yeah, I was dragged kicking and screaming to my first open mic and fell in love with it. And I can't imagine doing anything else with my life now, like comedies, like, but, like, it would be ideal if I like could get paid for like doing comedy and just have that as a job. But I do have like really big comedy goals too. Like I do want to be one of the greats. And and if they say it's better to aim high than miss than name low and hit. So it's like, all right, Mark Twain Award. Let's go. So what made you say yes to this interview? Um I get my validation through strangers. Uh, no, um, no, I like the idea that, uh, it was like talking about like real shit and like being authentic as, as much as like, I love my family, it pains me to say it, but a lot of the people in my family are super fake and don't say what's on their mind unless they're just in a bitchy mood. So it's like <laughs> right. a lot of like insincerity, like band kind of compliments, like bitching at somebody for one reason but really being mad for another. It's all like, you know, we can all just talk to each other like human beings. So I do like. What makes you different? Why, why don't you like, why don't you act that way? Why are, why are you so different from your family? Um, there's times when I can be like that, but there was uh, like, she's my hero. I actually have her name tattooed on my wrist. Leo. Um, she was my grandma and she's probably, well, she was, probably the most real most savage motherfucker you would ever meet in your whole life she wasn't like she was like a good catholic woman but like the rest of my family who gets like butter and everything my grandma will say the most devastating thing to you 
regardless of your age, your skin color, your background. You could be president of the United States. You could be a, just a cat that she's mad at. She will cuss you the fuck out. And uh, I always appreciated <laughs> that about her. Like, and a whole bunch of, like, fake people. And, like, just, like, grown-ass women asking, acting like high school girls. Like, there was my grandma. It's all like, yeah, you're fucking up. And then, it, like, nobody in my family likes my grandma particularly, except for me and my grandpa. And my nephew, Sean. That's about it. Everybody else, like, her nicknames were Grandma Cujo, the dragon. Um, shit, what else did they call her? Like, Cujo made me the laugh more, because most, because my mom's like, yeah, you know that evil dog that Stephen King wrote about? That's her, because she's a fucking bitch. I'm like, okay. But, yeah, my grandma was a bitch. So, I mean, I, I, I've come to learn that a lot of people relate honesty and authenticity with kind of being a bitch. Yeah. Um, oh, that's on both sides. Both, both people who say they are authentic will sometimes actually just be a bitch. And sometimes people who are just being authentic will get called a bitch. I think it can be like, you know, appropriated incorrectly on yeah. both ways. What do you, what do you think authenticity is? Um, it's uh, a good question. So, yeah, no, like, just if something's on your mind, say it. Like, you, I don't like, like, ca like, I personally can't stand being in a room where I feel like I have to pretend to be a different version of myself. Like, I shouldn't have to change myself for every social situation. And my mom was actually really fucking good at that. And, like, I got that from her for a while. It's all, but, like, I just mm -hmm. go and, like, I just chameleon myself into whatever room. And it's like, okay. But, uh, then I got tired and angry. And then I kind of did go into bitch mode for, like, five years. Some call it being a teenager. Um, but, yeah, and no, I started, like, because. Were you actually a teenager, though? Um, yeah, but I started getting, like. I got really mean for a while, like I'd say between 15 and 20, then I got really sad and then really meaner. Um, I don't know, like it was weird. Like there was a whole bunch of like tipping points that you have enough fucked up shit back, ha fucked up shit happen to you. You're just kind of like, what? why am I going out of my way to make others comfortable? Like maybe I want them to feel uncomfortable. And like, I will admit there's like sometimes where I'm just like, I'm just going to say some outlandish shit to make you uncomfortable because I'm always uncomfortable and I want you to know what it feels like to feel out of place. Like sometimes it's that like when I go down that mm. path, but um, yeah, but I'm weird. So I'm just weird now. Like what makes what makes you say that? What makes you say that I'm weird? Uh, I get told it a lot, and, like, I don't follow a lot of the norms, especially in my family. Like, no one in my family particularly likes to read. I was a big reader. I'm the only one of my mom's kids who doesn't have kids. Uh, I've never been married. I don't like relationships at all. Huge one-night stand, girl. I can't wait till I have hooker money. Save a lot of time and effort. Uh, like I overshare, I guess. But because I'll just tell family stories, and like other people will be telling family stories, but theirs is like wholesome. It's like remember when we went to Epcot Center, and we got the hats, and we laughed and signed, and took pictures with Mickey. Meanwhile, I'm like, do you remember that time I put your head through the drywall because you pissed me off, and then you slammed my head on the refrigerator, and we broke the glass window. Or I'll like tell a regular story, like how yeah, wow, we're a violent people. <laughs> but like I also didn't know a lot of shit that happened at my house wasn't normal for other people, and I'll like, just tell a story. And one of my friends, Lou, he made me laugh. He's like, "Sally, yeah, every time I think you can't say anything more depressing about your life, you somehow outdo yourself each time." I'm like, I wasn't even trying to be depressing. I was just talking about my dad. But I did right. notice. Well, if if it makes you feel better, 
you you are here with another person who also calls himself weird. Um, I think that people who are honest about their situation are often construed weird, but I'm I'm actually owning that. Like I'm I'm totally okay with being weird. My kids are all they all call themselves weird and are they're happy about it. And I think that's kind of the way that the world should be. If we were all the same, how boring would that well, be? That's true. And like I do love that I live in Austin now and like their whole their saying is keep Austin weird. And like they have it on shirts and everything. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, you know what? That's actually pretty cool. Like I like that. Still confused by horse shit girl, but I respect what she did. I doubt that was fucking weird. That was nuts. I don't know. Um, there was. I don't know anything about that. So, uh, like a couple of months back, um, so they closed. Like I live on Sixth Street, and they call it Dirty Six. But like for major events and like Friday, like Thursday through sometimes Sunday, at least Thursday through Friday. Um, they closed down 6th Street and, like, they'll tow the cars if they're in the way, but everybody just walks through 6th Street and just goes from, like, one bar to another. But they have, um, the mounted police division and, like, police Mm -hmm. cars and everything everywhere. But the mounted police went by and a horse took a shit in the middle of 6th Street. (laughs) And this drunk girl runs up to it and starts rolling around in it. And that's how she got the name Horseshit oh, Girl. Why? Yeah, exactly. But then I guess <laughs> I'm guessing somebody got this on video. Um, yeah, you can look it up on YouTube. And like, I'm trying to find the interview oh because God. like they interviewed her afterwards, and like I'll never forget her response when they asked her why. She's like, "I'm an artist," and it's all like, "What the fuck?" <laughs> like I re- like it's like fashion insane, but Oops. you gotta respect that. <laughs> I mean, if. If you think that's art, then, yeah. you know, bully for you. But I think it stinks. Boom, boom. Uh, so can you tell me what are some ways that you are described both correctly and incorrectly by others? Um, I get told I'm intimidating a lot. Like just when I'm sitting by myself, like it's mostly like the newer comics now. But I get told I'm either intimidating or unassuming. Like, I uh-huh. got told by someone, and I actually do agree with the statement. It's all like, I think you'd do well in prison. And, I'll, and I'm like, you know what? Yeah, I'd run that shit. <laughs> I really would. <laughs> Have you ever seen, um, oh, God, what is it called? It's the Australian prison show. It's about a woman's prison, and I just totally blanked on the name, but I love it. Um, there's a, there's a, a bigger woman named Boomer. They call her, her name is Boomer, but they call it Boomer because it's in Australia. And she, I think that she kind of has that same thing going where people think that she's mean, but she's like, like honestly like a super sweet person. But she she will bring the heat if she has to, and will will kind of you know mess some people up. And I like I miss that show because she was awesome. Yeah. Um. There's. I'll have to check it out. Uh, the other thing is a lot of people do think I'm sweet, <laughs> and like it could honestly go either way. I do have bipolar disorder. So if you catch me in the wrong day or the right time, like some days I want to throw down other days. I'm like, come here, rest your head on my shoulder. So I am all over the place. I think a lot of people think I'm smarter than I am. I'm just, I've just read a lot. So like, I mean, isn't that what, what being smart is just having the information from reading? Like maybe, but like, I do stupid shit all the time. Like, I, like, I'm trying to think of an example. Uh, like, I for, like, I'll forget I'm wearing makeup, and then I'll, like, look at myself in the mirror, and, I'll, like, this happened at Skankfest. I wasn't even drunk yet. But, like, I go to the bathroom, and I was wearing lipstick, and as I'm approaching the mirror, and I'm like, shit, this chubby prostitute's about to ask me out, and I don't have the money. And I'm like, oh, wait, that's me. <laughs> But you were going to say yes if you had the money, right? Yeah. So, I mean, that's a big compliment to yourself. Like, you would date you. Yeah, grudgingly. Just, no. Uh, well, at least, you would at least one night stand you. Uh, 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 multiply <laughs> night stand myself. Um, sorry. Uh, no. Vibrators. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, no, like, I don't know if I actually would date me. Like, I'll do shit like the stuff you're supposed to do in relationships because it's like 
I can just do that. Like, we both like, I want somebody to buy me flowers. And I'm like, or I can go buy me flowers. I know what flowers I like. I know the color I like. I can help them rearrange them. But like, yeah, I can buy me flowers. I can take me out to dinner. I can go to the movies. And I'm going to ask a a deep question here because you you just told me that you're bipolar. Mm -hmm. You've got some stuff going on. Um, are you do you actually not like relationships or are you afraid to put yourself into one fully because you're afraid that your bipolar is going to make somebody not do those things for you that you that you want out of a relationship okay i will admit that is like a part of it but the whole thing is it sounds fucking exhausting dude like just like the constant checking in on each other (laughs) and like i like to be by myself a lot too like i like being going out and being social but I don't want to be around somebody 20, like not 24 seven, but like living with somebody sounds awful. Like I get annoyed when people like, depending on the person, there's some people I can talk to every day, but I'll be all like, yo, I'm not going to talk to you for a couple of days. Not you. I, uh, I'm just feeling antisocial. So I'm like, okay, yeah, we get it. Or like, but the other thing is like, I just, so many bad relationships I've seen in my family alone and like just seeing like the crazy shit that's going on like everybody in my family's cheating on each other with everybody remember I lost my mind at a family reunion one time and started pointing out everybody's flaws because they told me not to be sad because like my mom drove me nuts um because like especially around Christmas time she'd be like I should just kill myself I'm worth more dead than I am alive then maybe you guys would have something. But, like, your mom's saying she should kill herself, like, ten times a day, every day. Like, that fucks with you. And, like... I, I, can, I, I can agree with you. The reason my mother and I don't talk is because she committed... Or she attempted to commit suicide and blamed it on me. So yeah, that, that was, like, the last fuck. toxic <laughs> thing that I, I could handle with. I was like, wow okay, I think that maybe you and I need some time apart. And, like, there has been that. Like, I'm slowly starting to talk to my family members again, but after, like, before, like, my depression started, like, kicking in a while before I uh, actually started doing comedy, but, like, there's this weird period where, like, I think I was, like, a couple months into comedy, and that's the first time I went to the psych ward because I had a psychotic manic episode. And, uh, that, that was a whole fucking thing, because, like, I was happy, and, like, I hadn't been happy in a long time, and I was finally happy, and I thought I figured everything out, and, like, it, like, having a psychotic manic episode is, like, being on a lot of drugs at the same time. Like, the closest comparison I could say is one time I did some acid and a whole bunch of cocaine, which I would not recommend. That's they don't even have a name for that because nobody puts those two together. Like that's not something people do. Yeah, because you shouldn't. Um, <laughs> yeah. Like I did it the one time, but all sitting there, it's like, uh, okay, this reminds me of me going to the psych ward. And I'm like, I'm gonna give this little baggie to you, and then yeah. So let me let me ask you. Like I, I hear about you know bipolar, manic manic depressive episodes, stuff like that all the time, but. I I'm not a bipolar person. I'm ADHD. I'm very open about the you know fact that I've had some general anxiety issues uh-huh. and like I've been through some depressive periods as well. But like the bipolar thing is it's totally different. I've had like I feel like a small degree of mania is normal in a lot of different mental illnesses, but with bipolar it's it's different. Like it's next yeah. level. What is how often do you enter that mania state and is that like really your only happy um no but like the whole first psych ward trip i went to a god-awful place and i like anybody who listens if you're in arizona and they try to send you in the guidance center in flagstaff arizona just kill yourself there because those people almost (laughs) fucking destroyed me um they they pumped me full of a whole bunch of drugs like i get like they had to sedate me and bring me down from the mania but like the way they explain it to me, it's like, okay, so because you have bipolar disorder, none of your emotions are real. And I'm like, what? It's all like, mm-hmm. whenever you're happy, you're not happy. You're manic. Whenever you're sad, you're not sad. You're depressive. When you don't feel anything at all, that's when you're normal. 
And like the way they said that, it's all like that doesn't sound Ooh. like. So what about other people who are like happy? And like I like tried to like get more clarification on it. I ended up going to like a different psychiatrist afterwards and like talking to her, and she's like, "No, like if something good happens to you and you're happy, that that's that's a proper response." But like the thing is, being mm-hmm. happy for no reason, and like I said, I just had a depressive episode. Like I'm doing better than I have in a long time. Like I'm doing well with comedy. I haven't been homeless in like five months. Um, I've been showering every day, which small victories. <sighs> overrated. <Yeah. laughs> Showering every day is it's not really overrated. It is just so hard to do. I'm ADHD getting in and out of the shower. Like if I don't have something to do where people are going to possibly smell me, I'm like, this is not a priority. Well, like, that does. I should, I should do better. That's fair. Um, no, but there's been like, I do have hygiene issues when I'm sad, but yeah, I just woke up sad on, I think it was either Thursday or Wednesday of last week. And uh, I finally started pulling out of it last night, but like from Monday until yesterday, I'm like forcing myself to leave the house, even though I didn't want to, writing in my mood journal, getting out of bed. Um, but it's really hard. So, yeah, I, I saw a couple of your Facebook posts whenever I was, you know, tracking you down. And, you know, I saw a lot of like force myself to get out today, you know, the experiences that you had when you force yourself to get out it seems like that forcing yourself out does provide a lot of like lubrication for the machine of getting back to a normal state. Like, can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. Um, it does help. I don't know how to explain it, but then I started like remembering other things. Like I have a booklet. I need to figure out where I put it. Like I know it came with me, but it's like a whole bunch of like self care things to do. Cause like there is a lot of work with bipolar disorder. Like, it is manageable and like I'm finally on meds that like actually work and don't turn me into a fucking zombie <clears throat> but I do still have my highs and lows um but yeah forcing yourself to get out and like they're like one of the things is I guess like singing releases endorphins so when I forget about that like I'll sit there and like sing along to sad songs but it'll kind of like perk me up a little bit um mm-hmm. try not to fix it like it really depends but there are like there's days when i'm not sad and i just want to be by myself and i'll be like okay by myself for three days i'm gonna read books and stuff but then there's other days where it's all like isolation it's like i don't want to talk to anybody i don't deserve to talk to anybody it's all like i can't make this shit other people's problems it's like i'm not worth it and like you just start to spiral and then you get lower and lower. It's all like, I don't deserve this. It's all like, you know what? I'm fat. I'm not going to eat because it's not like I need food. Um, I'm going to over drink. I'm going to chain smoke this entire pack of cigarettes. Um, like, and like I do self-harm sometimes. I haven't done it in a while. But uh, I think the last one was like nine, ten months ago now. But, like, I do know that's, like, because I have my safety plans in place because I notice there's steps. It goes into, like, isolation, not showering, and then, like, being tired but not necessarily sleeping. Just kind of, like, laying in bed all day and then self-harm. And normally when it gets to self-harm, it starts to go. It's like, maybe I should just walk into traffic kind of shit. So I know when I have those thoughts and I'm like, fuck, I have to pull out of shows, check myself into the psych ward, and, like, figure this shit out. How many times have you been in a psych ward? Uh, Three times total. The first one for the psychotic manic episode, which, like, being too happy doesn't sound like a problem, right? But, like, the problem with, like, mania... (laughs) That's fair. But, like, the thing is, and how it was explained to me, it's like the thing is you have illusions of grandeur and you think you're capable of anything and everything. So you feel so good. You convince yourself you're Superman and then you try and do Superman shit, like jump off the side of the building. You're not trying to kill yourself. You just think you can mm. fly. So that's yeah. how that can be dangerous. And then like sometimes like parts of it are like auditory. 
uh, hallucinations, visual hallucinations. Like I have another friend who helped me when I found out I was bipolar because she's bipolar. Also, there's different levels. There's bipolar one that I have where you have the ups and the highs. There's bipolar two where it's just like you're in the middle and down. Like, but it's either like you're good or you're depressed. You're good or you're depressed. And then bipolar one is all like boom, mm. boom. And then there's like cyclomidia, I think it's called, where it's just like constantly, it kind of looks like a heartbeat. It's like, or a dolphin jumping out of the water. It's like, I'm up, I'm down, I'm up, I'm oh, down. Geez. But, um. Well, so, so real quick, <laughs> can you, you're, you're talking about being depressed on the back of what, what seems mm-hmm. like the, your entire, your entire world opening up for you. Yeah. Like, you know, after that kill Tony, you, you know, appearance, it seems like, like this is the conversation is going totally different than I thought it would. And that's, that's completely okay. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm here uh-huh. for it. Like, and I, and I appreciate you being honest with your story, but whenever something like what happened on the show happens to hear that you're coming off of a, like a pretty serious depressive episode is really kind of jarring. Do you share that with people in your everyday life? Like, do they know that you're depressed? Yeah, no, I'm, again i'm pretty open and like when i post on facebook because like i didn't have it for the long time and it's weird because like the first time i got depressed like i was dismissed by like my entire family my mom said i was too sarcastic to be depressed my sister said i'd get over it it's just a phase and then i tried to kill myself two weeks later and didn't tell them i didn't say shit to them and then like i kind of opened why would you yeah and I worked at McDonald's with my brother at the time. And yeah, like I didn't want to tell anybody. And I was like, I was very ashamed. And I'm like, why am I like this? It's like, I should be thankful. And like, I'm Catholic. So there's all that guilt. It's all like, Jesus didn't die on a cross for you to throw your life away. And then uh, mm-hmm. like all that shit. But like, I started talking to my brother a little bit about it. And like, I'll tell them when I go to the psych ward, but they're pretty kind of like, okay. That's fine. I'm like, all right, but I'll tell my friends and they're like, okay, we're going to get a care package for you. Here are our numbers for you to write down. So I like went from like being depressed and like trying to deal with it all by myself to having people who actually do care and uh, comics. I love stand up comedians so much because we, it's just an eclectic group of the craziest, meanest, sweetest fucking people you'll ever meet. Like, if my sister tells me to go kill myself, like, I'm going to assume that she, like, actually wants me to. If a comic tells me to go kill myself, right. that's just how we say hi. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, you can't yell. That's like an I love Yeah, like, I. That's like an I love you, yeah. right? Like, uh, yeah. <laughs> but, like, how, like, me and my friends greet each other is, like, just yelling, like, slurs at each other. It's like, what the fuck are you doing? And like one time I was sitting there, it's all oh like, yo, goodness. go back to Mexico, you stupid wetback. And I turned around, I was about to throw down because I thought somebody was calling one of the cashiers a wetback. And it turns out it was one of my friends yelling mm-hmm. at me. And I'm like, oh, okay. It's like, hey, it's like, how you doing? He's like, good. Can I join you? It's like, yeah, of course. But he like sits down. I'm like, he's not racist. We're just friends. And then the cashiers went back to what they were doing. So um, can I'd like for the audience who doesn't know your story yet like i i would like for you to tell kind of how the kill tony experience went for you because like i I, first off how many times have you done a minute on the show um i've been on the show three times so the first time like all they all all of them went well and um like the first time i went out i did like it's called my dad joke set but i say do you like dad jokes and then I just tell fucked up jokes about shit things my dad did. Because, <laughs> like, one of them was, like, my dad had a really long rap sheet. Sometimes I'd wrap it around myself and pretend he was hugging me. So, like, that's one of them. That is good. So there was that. And then, so that happened in Phoenix. And, like, Tony liked me enough. He let me open for him the next day at Stand Up Live. And then, like, you see it if you watch the whole interview from the last time. It, gets brought up the last two times I was on Kill Tony about how I drank half of his Crown Royal and then left. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah. I, I need to get a handle on my drinking. Um, I really do. But, um, yeah, so I did well that time. And then I happened to get up, like, I think it was after two, three months living here. I think I'm on month four or five of living here now. But I get up again, and uh, the guest on that night was Ty Rivera, who is a fucking hysterical comedian. And um, granted, does seem kind of bitchy. Actually, a really cool fucking dude. Um, but yeah, it was that night, and like I decided, like I was sitting there, like I'd already decided when I moved to Austin, because like I signed up for Keltony like eight times at that point while I was in Austin. But they called my name and I wasn't expecting. I'm like, oh, okay. But like, I had already decided the minute I was gonna do, and I was gonna be my uh, miscarriage set, where I just joked about my miscarriages for like one minute straight, because like it's like I want to make an impression. Yeah. And like, I want people to know what kind of comic I am. And like, I have, I've had so many people tell me like. That's what was frustrating a little bit about the Arizona scene is like I had comics like, so you're such a talented joke writer. If you just wrote clean, you could get work. And like, I get that. And like, I could, but like, that's not me as a person. Like, I have a dirty mind. I had a fucked up childhood. I have mental illness. And I did not have a wholesome upbringing and i've done some shitty shit and i i I don't understand why other comedians would tell you to do a different kind of comedy because there's there's other people doing clean comedy there's other people talking about those other things you nobody can talk about your story but you like that's you own that so why would anybody and and it's funny and i think that you are gonna get work i mean you already have gotten work from doing your thing I think that somebody to tell you if you just wrote clean is like really bad advice because then you would be doing something that didn't make you happy at all. Yeah. And you felt like you were going to work every time you did a set and that would, that would suck. Yeah, it, like it does suck. And like, I've always had a fucked up sense of humor too. Like I've always like, Oh, I get called morbid a lot. And like, I just like, I, I get laughs like even before I started doing comedy I just answer honestly and I notice like speaking from the heart and answering honestly you do get that like huh like you like people will laugh at that like just the huh that's refreshing kind of thing and I do think that happened the last Mm -hmm. time I was on Kill Tony because like Tony was asking if my mom was still alive and I said unfortunately both of my parents are deceased and he's like god damn it and I could tell he really wanted to do something nice for me, but like he said it, and I'm like, I get it. But like I said, it's like, yeah, I was mad too. And I was. It pisses me off that my it parents. Was, it was so funny. Like, it was so funny because yeah, it was absolutely an honest statement. Where yeah, it's like Tony, you're a, you you're mad that her parents are dead. How do you think she yeah. feels? And you 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 juxtapose that perfectly. Like I feel like it was honestly like a perfect joke because it was just honest. And like that, that's why I, I connected with you so much is because your humor was obviously based in a very honest place. Like I felt like it was all so sincere, fucked up, not like not all of it was really fucked up, but some of it was very yeah. fucked up. And but it but it was it's your life. Like if you can't find the humor in your life and be able to laugh about some of that stuff, especially whenever you have bipolar, like then you're going to be really depressed about your life all the time. And that's like, I don't think that's a great way to look at it. So like, I'm, I'm glad that you're sharing that humor with other people and connecting with other people because there are other people who have lives that are fucked up like yours. And they're going to say, I love you for telling our story in a funny way. And that's why I like doing dark comedy too. Cause like one, I joke, like there are comics who do like dark and edgy shit because they're just trying to shock you and get a reaction that's like i want to make you laugh like by shocky kind of a little bonus but like some of the time but like Mm -hmm. what it is is like it opens a dialogue like i want jokes that make people laugh and make people think and make them feel less alone because like stand-up comedies like 
almost all the times I've like gotten pulled out of like dark places, like because I'd watch Comedy Central like religiously and watch like the Comedy Central presents every time we went to Hollywood video when that was a thing. I'd go to the stand up section. <laughs> I'd go up to the stand-up section and like it's like this one this one and like I used to watch stand-up with my dad and like after he left like I'd still watch it all the time and like I and like I talk about it during the last Kill Tony interview how my mom said women aren't funny which is weird for her to say because that bitch was hysterical but um mm. every time like I wow that makes me really curious because like whenever I was going to get to that part where she told you that, you know, that that was never going to be a job that worked for you, but she was funny herself. Yeah, She was funny herself. And then the other thing is like, I was supposed to be her successful child. I know. Cause she said it over and over again. And like everybody in my family was kind of like, okay, yeah. So you can be bitchy. So is weird. But uh, if anybody's going to make it out of this town, it's her for whatever reason mm-hmm. that like, I get told, like, I like when I really like something and I'm passionate about it, like, I am dedicated to it. Like, I have an unhealthy obsession with killer whales, Batman. I was really into martial yeah. arts for 10 years. I do need to get back into that. Um, Like, just, like, I love to read and learn and I love to write. But, like, generally, once I like something, like, I stick with it, which most of my family, they'll, like, do it for a little bit. And then, like, stop altogether. And I do remember, like, part of it because a little weird, but I was born with my leg not in my hip socket. And uh, they had to do a surgery on me, and if it wasn't successful, they said I'd probably be in a wheelchair by the time I was 20. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, but it was successful. And, like, when I'm really tired and sore, you can tell. Like, you can see I have a really bad limp. But, like, when I'm not sore and I'm, like, stretched out and stuff, you generally can't tell but like I was supposed to be in a wheelchair um and like everything I wanted to do when I was a kid my mom told me no because one of my older sisters fucked it up (laughs) because my mom like because my sister wanted to play the violin and my mom was like okay runs the violin my sister quits after two weeks and says I want to play the flute so that happens then there was baton and girl scouts and karate so, like, everything I wanted to do, my mom would always be like, why? So you can quit like your sister. And, like, the one she agreed to let me do was Girl Scouts. Because I'm like, Mom, it's only $12 to apply for the registration fee. Here's the $12. Just sign here. You don't have to do mm. anything. And she's like, I don't have to give you rides. And I'm like, the Girl Scout leader lives in Smoke Rise. It's just a walk down the street. And she's like, okay. And she's like, you really want to be a Girl Scout? And I'm like, yeah. And she's like, follow me. And then she opens her closet, and there's this huge green jacket just covered in Girl Scout badges. Wow. And, um, yeah, I stuck with Girl do you, Scouts. Do for... you think part of the reason why she, like, was so down on you is because, for one, she wanted you to succeed and, like, wanted to find the perfect thing that you were going to succeed at? And, two, that you guys were really, really similar? Like, maybe people told her that she wasn't funny, even though you said she's hilarious, but maybe people didn't like her mouth because she, you know, was saucy and always making jokes and stuff. And they're like, women aren't funny. So shut up. Yeah. That like, that's an interesting way to look at it too. Um, My dad thought she was funny too. And like, I asked my dad, it's all like, why are you mom together? If you guys are so mean to each other, he's like, I love your mother. She's beautiful. She gave me two beautiful kids and she makes me laugh and she's hardworking. Good woman. And I'm like, okay. So like that being said, she's insane. It's all like, yeah. Hmm. But um, yeah, so my mom was batshit crazy and my dad was an alcoholic. Um, was she bipolar also? Addict. I think she was undiagnosed bipolar and I think my grandma was also undiagnosed. I was the first person in my family to get an actual mental diagnosis and go to therapy. And mm-hmm. like, I started talking to a therapist because like I couldn't talk to my family. And, like, they started telling me shit. It's like, why are you going to a therapist? Why are you taking these medications? You just need God. It's all like, maybe God's punishing you for being a sinner. And it's all like, or your life doesn't have purpose because you don't have children or a man in your life. Hmm. And that's another thing. Like, a lot of the women in my family think your life doesn't have purpose unless you're a wife and mother. And, like, my mom was kind of like that to an extent. 
but she's all like as long as you're a wife and a mother you can do whatever you want except for the stand-up comedy but like this bitch did say like she's like i think he'd be a great president and then but she'd also have like other weird dreams for me which was all like i think you're gonna be playmate of the year and i'm like what and she's like if you lose the weight baby like if you just need to lose a little bit like you're thick you've got it in all the right spots and then you can make your sister feel like shit and like my mom was so mean to my fucking sister and like less mean to my like she loved us but like her and my sister they did not get along at all so so she wasn't the meanest to you you like you didn't get the no i actually got less of it and i definitely got beat less because i was crippled which in turn i think that's why my brother was such a dick to me when we were little and like me and my brother would get into actual like physical altercations (laughs) like like he did put my head through a glass window um i've slammed him through a coffee table i've slammed his head in the fridge like we just did awful shit to each other wow we're good like we're better now (laughs) um i I hope you're better now because that's like jail time right um so the thing was for some reason my dad was the hardest on my brother and like my brother is the one who got the shit beaten out of him like he was Hmm. mama's little boy but like my dad was he could be really sadistic towards my brother and like he could be the same towards my sister but like i was the baby and like once i started to like be able to walk and stuff and i started running my mouth like like i'd get the same but like my dad didn't beat me up as much as like my mom did and i think that was like when she was having manic episodes because like also mania like it can be happy but it can also be angry just like psychotically angry for no reason but like and my mom would go through these phases where she'd be like depressed and like and we like my mom said that she said we were the apple of her eye but she'd conveniently forget that fact as soon as a guy made eye contact with her that she liked Mm. because like we had a lot of like stepdads and stuff too jim was cool the last one was a piece of shit. I'm glad he's dead. Um, and wow. me and my mom stopped talking for a little while because of her last husband, because she didn't believe me when I told him that he was like masturbating on my door when she was at work and he was like doing other shit. And she's like, Sally, are you really that miserable? You don't want me to be happy. She's like, you're just like your father. You're just like your grandma. And I'm like, wow. okay. Like, my family was all over the place. So whenever you have somebody who's that close to you, like, I mean, your mom is like, you know, she's literally the, the origin of your being tell you something like you're just like your father. Like you're so miserable. You don't want to be happy. What is it like? Like how did you handle those types of like, uh, judgments being laid on you? Did you, did you take those on or did you just say my mom's crazy? Like I can't listen to her. Well, at first, honestly, like, I know this is stupid and this is, like, I can be a very naive person, but, like, I also try and examine when people are telling me shit. Like, somebody's saying, it's like, hey, you did this and made everybody uncomfortable. And, I, like, okay, let me examine it. And, like, like, I'll ask other people, too. It's all like, hey, did I make you guys uncomfortable? Was this out of line? And, like, even if I don't like the answer and the answer is, like, yes, I'm like, fuck. But the fact my mom was saying that shit to me, like, I just thought she was right. And I'm like, damn, maybe I am an asshole. Maybe I am selfish. Mm. And, like, I just felt bad. It's all like, okay, she sacrificed so much. But then I started, like, when she, like, started saying, I was like, my dad and my grandma, like, other things kind of, like, things started clicking more and more, especially with the last husband, Brian, when I feel like, it's like, you know what? It's not okay for her to disappear for two weeks at a time to go to Laughlin to fuck some dude. It's like, that's not okay. It's like, it's not okay to beat the crap out of somebody because you thought they rolled their eyes at you and you didn't. Um, And then, like, her whole, like, suicide. Like, I'd never tell her not to be sad, but I'd try and cheer her up. And I think that's part of the reason I, like, loved comedy, too, and really wanted to do it when I was a kid. Because, like, uh, like, 
Um, so I got a whole bunch of the kid joke books and just like the most annoying kid jokes you'll ever hear. Like, what do you call a sleepwalking nun? A Roman Catholic. But like, yeah. But I was driving I like my family. It. I like that one too. But um, I'll, I would tell these jokes to my family and they're like, okay, this needs to stop. So my dad buys me this giant book called the Mammoth Book of Comedy. And it's full of all the raunchiest fucking street jokes you'll ever read. Like jokes about Catholics, jokes about sex, making fun of the Jews jokes about like jokes about everything and anything mm. and like it's alphabetized alphabetized too and like it'll have quotes from like comics i think like i can't remember mm, was patrice and neil in there like i know they have a lot of old school comics like i think it came out before patrice was like big big um but like they'd have a uh, roseanne Barr quotes in there ronnie dangerfield quotes penny Youngman. Don Rickles. Um, so there'd be like quotes from them. There'd just be short jokes. There's like mistranslations, funny bumper stickers throughout the world, funny epitaphs. But I started memorizing all those jokes, and my dad would have me sit at his poker games and tell these jokes to him and his friends. So, like, I, uh. I just liked making people laugh and like not being sad. And I do that all the time. But like, when I lost my shit at the family reunion, my mom came up to me and was like, Baby Bear. It's all like, don't be sad, because if you're sad, I'll be sad, and I don't want to be sad. And, like, when she said that, like, a flip switched, and I'm all like, wait, you don't want me to be sad, because you'll be sad? Like, you are the most miserable fucking person I have met in my entire life. It's like, you threaten to kill yourself on a daily basis. And, like, I went off, and I'm like, but never, not once did I ever tell you not how to feel. And, like, I started screaming at everybody in my family. I'm like, can I have emotions for once? Can I be sad? Can I be miserable? And, like, because for the longest time, I was just pretending to be happy so everybody else would be happy. Like, because right. my grandpa was all, like, lead by example. It's like, okay, if I'm happy and I try my hardest, everybody else will do the same. That is not how that shit went down at all. And, yeah, no. So, and I just started, like, thinking about my family more and more and, like, how we were and, like, I started taking, like, pages from my grandma's book. It's like, you know what? I'm going to be honest with this bitch. So I would be a bitch back. But, like, when I said it was funny. Yeah. So, so I know it's probably hard to separate this because you are bipolar and you, I mean, that's something that you have to deal with all the time. But as you started to, like, embrace that, like, honesty, did you find that outside of just being a depressed person, did you find that your life was easier to manage? It did help a lot. Um, it did feel like a like huge weight had been lifted off me. Like I didn't realize how much I was holding on to and like how much I was trying to keep it together. And like whenever I was sad, like because like after I think it was like when my dad died, I kind of stopped crying for a couple of years. Like I would on occasion, but like, I'm just all like, no, it's like, I'm not going to cry for this man. And it's like, I'm not going to do this. And I just stopped. I'm like, I'm not crying for anybody else. I'm not. And my mom cried all the time. And like, in my mind, I thought she was weak because of it, but um, she wasn't mm -hmm. weak. Like at the time I didn't know that this was during my bitchy teenage phase. But, like, it's, like, I don't want to be, like, these fucking crybabies. I don't want to be, like, these miserable people. It's all, like, if anything, I'll be angry. I'll be angry. I'll be happy. But I'm not going to let these people go make, see me sad or make me sad. And my family is really good at that, too. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. Um, trying to think. Like, when I started cutting myself, I had one sister start calling me Slicey as my nickname. But, like, my family just Blessing. has, like, yeah. It's oddly brilliant for her. It still can't draw her eyebrows on straight, though. But, like, her nickname since she was a kid, my mom called her Lurch. Because she looked like Lurch from Madam's family. Wow. And, and like, That's I, rough. Yeah. And she'd call my brother a whole bunch of mean names. Like, she used to call him Bullwinkle and Jethro because he was ditzy. And she'd tell him he was dumb all the time. And, like, Damn. she'd tell my brother and sister they were dumb. And she's like, you're smart. You have potential. 
And like, I remember so is, it, is this where you do a lot of like roast battles? I haven't seen him yet. I'm going to look him up after this, but you do a lot of roast yeah. battles. Is this where you sharpen your tongue is for one, listening to your mom roast her kids all the time. And then yeah. I'm assuming at some point you started fighting back. Yeah, there was that, like, my sisters would pick on me, but they'd, like, say bitchy stuff, but, like, I, I'd just think of something, or I'd point out, like, when they did it, like, my sister Catherine, her biggest thing was, it's like, I've lost so much weight, and she was bigger than me at the time, now I'm a little bit bigger than her, but she's like, yeah. I've lost so much weight, I'm gonna give you these clothes since you're still fat, and, like, one day she said that, and I'm like, okay, you keep losing all this weight, but you get fatter every day. And, um, like, I forget what else I said. It's like, okay, but the clothes that don't fit you are supposed to fit me. And everybody started laughing. And, like, her daughter was, like, a little spoiled brat sometimes. And she was making fun of my first bow I bought because I got into archery. And it was, like, a shitty little 15-pound bow you get from uh, Big Five or Sporting Goods. Mm-hmm. And I had it, and she's making fun of it. And she's like, look at this poor ghetto-ass fucking bow you couldn't get anything better and i'm like oh i'm sorry we all can't have banks that we got from our parents or jobs that we got from our parents and wealthy Mm -hmm. like i said something but like it'd be me and my brother insulting each other a lot and like just saying the meanest shit and like i do remember one time he was being an asshole and i grabbed my box of tampons and threw it i had him it almost like plug your shit up you're bleeding all over the floor oh my god and i did that in front of him his friends and my family and like he just looked at me as like because the tampon box exploded on impact and he just like caught all these random condoms in his arm (laughs) or not condoms uh tampons yeah yeah and like he just looks at me for a sec and he starts laughing he's like fuck that was good and um that's that is good I want to I want to go back to Kill Tony a little bit real quick. So, okay, if I'm correct, you were you got on stage, you did your minute, and you hadn't realized who Roseanne was, right? Like you didn't. Yeah, like, so I guess going up, you didn't know who the guests were. One, I'm really bad at recognizing people, and two, when like my plan of attack, so I don't freak out before I do my minute, is to not actually like I do my best to like I'll give a quick glance, but I'll do my best not to look to see who's on the panel until after I do my minute. Because mm-hmm. otherwise, I'm gonna be when sitting there. When you saw like, that it was her, it was uh, it's weird. But when you saw that it was her, like, what, what is, what is your relationship to Roseanne? Like, you know, your history with following her. Is she like one of your idols? Like, she is one of my like? comedy idols. Oh, so my mom did think Roseanne was funny. She said she didn't like her stand up, but she loved the Ro- Like, she loved. Roseanne the show and like we'd watch it together Mm. all the time like my mom loved sitcoms and she did love to laugh but she wasn't a huge stand-up person like she liked all the blue collar comedy guys and um she hated Dave Chappelle um I'm trying to think of who else oh she loved Richard Pryor belly how do you love Richard Pryor and hate Dave Chappelle I don't know it doesn't even make any sense she has a weird lady so you saw her there and like it looked like your breath was completely taken away like i like that yeah, that was like the, setup for the whole thing yeah i mean i i agree like i'm kind of with your mom when like i liked the show a lot but i was really young when her stand-up was out so it's not like you know i i had a whole lot of uh experience with her stand-up as an adult yeah. uh, she might still be i mean i guess she is still doing stand-up because she went on to invite you to open her tour. Yeah. What happened? Because you were supposed to be there like on your way there right now. Like what, like what happened with that? Um, so I did the first show with her, but like, I guess her agent who set up the dates had the dates all spread apart. So it's like a week between each of the shows, except for the last two. But like, it does cost a lot of money to fly somebody to and from Austin and then put them in a hotel and like it like time management wise and also like no disrespect to Roseanne, but she's old now <laughs> and she gets tired and like she's doing an hour and like I think she, the night I open did get it open for her, she did like an hour and fifteen, an hour and thirty minutes. 
Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, she was really tired afterwards and wanted to go home and go to sleep. And um, but yeah, so, no, I. So was she not? She she couldn't put you up just to stay there like she was. Um, or does no, she live like, in Florida? From, she doesn't live in Florida. Um, but like her tickets plus my tickets, and her son is her assistant. So like she's flying him out too. Um, but like all the like having to set everything up, and like so also like when somebody else buys your like plane ticket and hotel rooms, like it is kind of weird. And you do normally need to have a card for incidentals. But like there's a couple of hiccups. Um, but yeah, now originally I thought I was just gonna miss the 14th show and I was gonna be back the 20th and the 21st. But when I messaged to ask about it, it's all like. No, the dates are too spread part apart. Like, I'm not mad by any means. It's like, sometimes no. things don't click, and it's, like, it's fine. But, um, yeah. Well, like, like, I'm A not trying to stir shit up, but, like, I'm, I'm curious. How much time have you actually spent talking to Roseanne face-to-face since Kill Tony? Um, I talked to her briefly at Skankfest for, like, five minutes, but, like, I was kind of in the days talking to her, like, face-to-face. Uh, I think we talked outside for about an hour, two hours before and after the show. And we did have some good conversations. The, and she said I was a Florida? shaman. Yeah. And oh, yeah, she did sure. say she wants to do some writing sessions with me. So at some point when she has a spare time, me and her are supposed to sit down and do joke writing. That'd be cool. Yeah, yeah I just like, I, I'm curious because the way it seemed and, you know, I understand that there are the people who that there's the talent who performs, who is like, you know, the, the name who makes all the money, but there's the people who run the show. And like, I understand that those generally are not the same people, but at the same time, whenever somebody puts something out, like I'm going to take care of you so you can (laughs) open for me. Like Mm -hmm. I kind of thought that the way that she delivered it was she was going to take care of you. So you could, you'd be able to open for the entire stretch. I'm just curious as to whether or not you've talked to her since, like the scheduling issues have come up and you've like, you know, asked like, Hey, did you mean for this to happen? Or like, are you, is, is this going to like, is this going down the way that you thought it would? Or do you want to try to like help me be able to do the whole thing? I know that that would be a, a lot well, we to ask to, a super famous person. It is. And like, I don't like, like I have a thing about like bothering people. Um, but yeah, we did talk, like, I know, like, I thought I was just not doing the Melbourne show, and I thought I clarified with her, but to be fair, we had all just smoked some weed, so people forget, but, like, I've mostly been, uh, I'm actually getting a message right now. From her? Um, no, from the son, because that's who I've been talking to, but she expected, I guess she's wanted me there right now. See, that's, I'm so curious. That's what I was wondering. Yeah, what, is, what does Nessa say? Uh, I'm not sure. Like, I will say I'm not comfortable, like, saying, because I don't want him to put the, no, put, like, put his business not, out Not there. exactly, but, like, are but you like, going to go out there this weekend now, or? Um, I don't, like, I guess it's possible for me to get a flight out there and be there for tomorrow's show. But, um, yeah, I don't know. But I guess, like, I got the message, and I guess she was expecting me to be there today. So, like, the reason why I wanted to ask all that is because I, too, am one of those people who doesn't want to bother people. Like, I'm, you know, I I never want to bother anybody. I never want to feel like I'm putting anybody out. But I try to, whenever somebody makes it clear that they want to do this thing with me, I've tried to make it a like a part of my culture to give people a chance to meet me where I'm at. So it's like, hey, you said you wanted to do this thing. This is what's going on with me. If you still want to do that thing, this is what needs to happen. Because I also want to do that thing, but there's some there's some things coming up. You know, whatever it is. And I was just like it being so like present and like current. I wanted like I was just curious if that's something that you had done. And now that we're seeing that he's reaching out saying like shit i was wrong like i probably should have you know asked my mom if i yeah, well <laughs> if i'm supposed to get I you did, out of here 
That's fair. I asked the week before, and he said, because the, like, he gave his reasons and stuff. And I'm like, okay, that all makes perfect sense to me. That's fine. And, um, yeah. So, I left it as, and, like, I was already depressed before we had that conversation. Mm. Yeah, because I think I messaged him on Thursday, and I started getting sad on Wednesday. But, um, oh, and then I do feel bad, because a lot of people, like, a lot of my friends, like, message me. It's like, Celia, did you really pull out of the Roseanne shows? I'm like, no, I didn't pull out. I was told I wasn't needed. <laughs> or not right. not that I wasn't needed, but it's all like, they said it wasn't, like, doable. And they're like, okay, we thought you dropped out because you were sad. And I'm like, no, I would have, like, I'm not going to, like, I will go on stage crying through my set. Like, I'll I'll go up there with a 40, like, just tears streaming down my face <laughs> with a cigarette saying, I don't want to live. <laughs> Good now. Um, I wouldn't yeah. do that. But, uh. Yeah, no. No, but like, um, uh, like I appreciate that mentality of not letting your not letting your sad ruin your future. Like that because this, you know, all of this is a huge opportunity. And if you would have gotten depressed before and let that depression make that decision for you, that would have been like whenever you came out of that, that would have been like possibly just wrecked you. Like put yeah, you back. I definitely would have. <laughs> like I'm mad at myself that I was depressed this week. Though I did get a good bit out of it. <laughs> Cause like so you know the Will and Jada shit going on right now? Yes, I like oh my god, yeah, I do. Yeah. All right. So I don't know the woman, but based off of everything I've seen, I'm gonna assume she's just a fucking rancid cunt. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Not that's not nice. But like she does have like queen bitch vibes. Um, but like I posted on Facebook. It's all like, here's my theory. Tupac faked his death to get away from Jada. And I was like, I was just in a bitchy mood when I typed that. And I'm like, backup theory. He walked right into his death to get away from Jada. So like, I went up on stage and I'm all like, I, so I did say that and I got a lot of laughs on Facebook, but I worked it into a bit where like, I start off. It's all like, I have no reason to be depressed right now. I have like, my life's going well. And there's people who have it worse than me. I could be married to Jada Pinkett Smith right now. And like that got a huge, like it got a three second applause break. And then All I right. say what I said on Facebook and like, that's been actually going really well. Like I, I feel bad. Cause she's probably actually a really nice lady. I don't know. I don't know. She's, she's one of the people who I think gives authenticity a bad name because she's one of the people who's like, this is just who I am. And it's like, you know, everybody else needs to, been their been their lives to like to fit my will and i yeah. think that is that is broken will smith as a man and that's super depressing because he's a very talented person who seems like he's he's not a bad guy but like i think that there's a lot to be said for what? knowing who you are and being willing to grow around and like bring other people into your life and it seems like she's not willing to do that She's just going to grow over people and really just like, she's not really growing. She's just rolling them over. Okay. Yeah. Like that's like, that's the vibes I get. Like I've seen a couple of clips of the red table talk and like, I don't know. There's just something about her. I don't freaking like, and like, she'll talk about like all this stuff. Um, oh, but like I watched the slap video multiple times. And, like, Will was laughing at that joke. Like, you see him clearly laughing at the joke. And then she had that face, and he's like... She was oh in my. total control of him. Like, from from that video, to me, it seemed super clear that she had total control over everything in that relationship because he was having a good-ass time. He was enjoying yeah. himself. He thought it was funny. He understands comedy. And then he was living for someone else didn't know how to approach the situation but he had to overcorrect because she saw him laughing and now wanted she wanted her pound of flesh and he didn't know what to do so he did something that definitely guaranteed that pound of flesh i guess that's true and that's the other thing and like i was actually like out of all the people like i would even go so far as to say i was a little hurt when i saw that he slapped chris rock because I know Will Smith has tried stand-up comedy. He knows what it's fucking like to go up there and tell jokes. 
and put yourself mm-hmm. out there. It's like it's a different medium from acting. Because like stand up comedy, you're going up with uh yeah, you're going up there and you're yourself. Like you don't get a play well, character. And, and like I'll, some people do characters and stuff, but I'll I'll say that it's even one step further for the being like I love stand up comedy. I'm a huge fan. I do not do it. Like I know that I am not that guy. I'm not the one. But like the Academy Awards and like really hosting something that high pro- high profile takes stand up comedy to the next level of of being under the microscope and that you have to like you have to be PC enough to go on all the channels. You have to be able to uh, like, you know, play to so many different demographics. There's so much pressure in that. And then to add that situation to it, to me was one of the Chris rock is one of the most impressive human beings in the entire world because he handled that with such grace. I cannot imagine being able to continue that show. Yeah. Like I'd be like, Nope, that was, that was too much. Like I'm done. Like that, yeah, it's that like happened. bring in the somebody else. Bring, gonna... Yeah, it's like send somebody else up there. Backup host, just hand the mic. It's like you're in charge now, bitch. Walk off. Yeah, exactly. This is yours. Like he just he ruined this moment for me. He ruined it for you. It's over. I mean, really, Jada ruined it through him by proxy. And I just yeah, yeah you have to be so vulnerable to do good stand up. And Chris Rock does a great job of that. And, you know, you have to be willing to, like, yeah. open yourself up to, to throw punches. Like, you know, just like in a fight. If you're throwing punches, you're open to being attacked back. And, yeah, yeah to, for that to happen, like, in that vulnerable state, oh, my God. Anyways. No, so, like, it is. Yeah. I, I want to get back to Tony a little bit. You have those okay. tour dates booked with Tony in November. How excited are you to, like, because he, like, he left no room for for interpretation he is flying you out he is putting you up in a hotel you are going to be taken care of yeah. and he's paying you so you are going to be taken care of that that is happening how excited are you for that to happen i'm really excited especially because celebrity theater is a huge venue um like tom segura did his special there his last one there i believe um so many great comics have performed there. So many great musicians have performed there. But I think it sets like 2,500 people. Wow. And like, I am, like, I'm excited, but I am a little scared shitless. Because for the first time, two of my families are going to, family members are going to be in the audience to watch. Well, just, four, just technically. two? Oh, four, my brother four. and his wife are coming. Well, my brother and his wife are coming. And then my sister and her oldest son, Sean, are coming. The other siblings had very good reasons. Like, oh, I have to go grocery shopping that day. It's like, you have it pre-planned to go and buy groceries November 18th at 7 o'clock. And another family member, it's all like, I'm not wasting a tank of gas to go see you tell talk about your vagina. And I'm like, first of all, I only talk about my vagina like 30% of the time. <laughs> the rest <laughs> is about cutting myself. Oh my god, that's, that's so... Yeah, uh, like... It's funny because when I do roast battles, like I will check with a person if I don't know them. Is like, is there anything off limits I can't roast you about? And I do that like partially. It's to be nice, but the other part is I don't want to deal with like the whole me too. It's like she crossed a line. Mm-hmm. It's all. It's like okay, but um, <laughs> shit, I forgot where I was going about. Oh, but um, yeah, but. I always tell everybody, it's like, there is nothing you can say to me that my own family hasn't said to me or I've said to myself. Like, yeah. it'd be like, it takes a lot to actually hurt me. I mean, <laughs> like, I'm to, used to being hurt. Um, to a degree, it, I, I could see how it would make you kind of bulletproof in roast battles, but also that's, that's fucked up. Like, that sucks that your family has been so unsupportive of your journey. It does. And like, I did cry when my brother said he was going to go. And I'm like, you're really going to come? And he's like, yeah, why wouldn't I? And I'm like, well, just based off of the last six years of me asking you to come. Like, to be fair, my brother did try and go watch me do stand up one time, but he just had a newborn baby and he did the Mexican thing. He showed up with a newborn baby (laughs) to the open mic I was at. Okay, that's fair. And I think the baby started crying like, like, I was like, I was confused because my brother was there. 
and then the baby started crying, so he had to leave like three minutes into my set. Oh. So like he did go see me do comedy once, and like my sister, like she is like high functioning autistic, which she just found out she was autistic like three years ago. And um, she did drive me to a show in Prescott from Flagstaff and back, but she didn't want to go in because like meeting new people sometimes gives her anxiety and stuff. Yeah. But she does know like what a big deal this is. And like, I was actually really excited because this year, both of them remembered my birthday. Oh. Um, uh, I know it sounds sad, No, I, but like they suck at remembering everybody's birthdays. Um, like they're, they're not bad people. They're like, they're just busy. And like, we were raised, like, it was just like years of abuse. And like, that's what we learned. And that's what we were taught. We like, it does break my heart a little bit because I wonder what my family would have and could have been if we were more supportive and an understanding of each other instead of like attacking each other and kicking each other when we're down. Yeah. And like, I've done it too. And I'm not proud of that. Well, but, um, we we were, we're like, direct byproducts of our parents. Like if our parents are unsupportive and, you know, verbally beat the crap out of us, <laughs> it's going to take a lot of work. Like, I'm not going to say that we're going to automatically be that, but you're going to have to actively work to not be what they were. Like, that's just, that's just how it works because you're, you know, they talk about nature versus nurture. Whenever it's your parents treating you a certain way, if it's nature or nurture, you're going to get it because it's, they, they are your genes and they are your environment. So whatever they have, you're going to get it. And it's going to be on you to try to like get better and be something different for the next generation, but it's not surprising that they are emulating a lot of the same things, but I'm for one, it does make it a little more understandable that your sister's autistic. Uh, it's often runs in the family. So there's a possibility that maybe your mother was autistic and that would give some credence to like the, the unabashed like honesty and like saying things that, that seems so mean to somebody who's supposed to love you. Um, but if you are not yeah. understanding of those. And that's a good way to like, once like my sister said she was autistic, she's like, I guess I'm autistic. And I looked at her and like everything clicked because her son, Sean is autistic. And like, he just does what pops into his mind. Like, mm -hmm. and he's not trying to be a dick no. though. Sometimes he is a little asshole, but um, no, as soon as she said, she's like, so I guess I'm autistic. I'm like holy fucking shit that explains everything this whole time i thought you were yeah. a bitch and then me and her just looked at each other and started laughing her asses off and she's like yeah i guess like mom just beat it out of me whenever i was having like crazy episodes but like the more i watched my sister and was around her like just thinking about the way she acted all the time and i'm like yeah that bitch is autistic she's not an asshole she doesn't think she's better than anyone which my mother loved to like tell and yell mm. at her all day it's all like your. It's a good thing your sister's beautiful because she doesn't have a fucking personality. Wow. It's like wow. she's miserable. She about her own daughter, and like that was the other thing when I started getting better at like roasting, like especially in my family. So like they just say it's like you're fat and you're crippled, and I'm like I know. But like when like I felt she was going too hard after my one of my brothers or sisters, I like I'd step in, and like I'd start being mean back or if I thought my sister's like because I don't know how to like almost like just like a pack of wolves or coyotes like circul circling mm -hmm. you like we one day it'd be like my sister Lisa who was getting like bullied and stuff but like everybody would start going after one person at a time and it's just like pack, pack. and like you can see like and I know they could see it too that they legitimately hurt somebody and they'd still keep going. It's all like, yeah, well, that's why this and this mm -hmm. and this. And then, like, I'll get mad. Like, I remember one time I cussed out my mom because she kept calling my brother dumb. And I'm like, quit calling him Jethro. And she's like, but, or, like, she'd call him Bullwinkle, too. And she's like, oh, I'm Bullwinkle. She's like, you're just like that dumb moose. And, like, after that argument, she just started calling him moose. And, like, she changed the story. It's like, I started calling, he used to be a bear, but he got so big, now he's a moose. I'm like, no, you started calling him moose because I got mad at you for calling him Bullwinkle. And, like, because my brother isn't dumb. 
and my sister isn't dumb, and she's not a bitch. The rest of my siblings kind of on the fence about. Um, so, so we've had the, this is like neurodiversity is something that like I'm a big advocate of because like I'm ADHD, so it's something that has largely shaped my life. So, I'm curious as you've kind of learned about the autistic situation with your sister, how has that changed your relationship? Um, it's made me like, it made me more understanding of her. And like, also like I started, like, I always loved my sister. Like I did, like I looked up to her. She's my hero. Granted, she was super bitchy most of her life, but like, I'd be a bitch too. If my mom talked to me the way she talked, my mom talked to her in the way other people talk to her. And my sister is awkward. She has a really hard time making friends. And um, I feel bad because one time she asked me, she's like, what's it like having friends? And I'm like, it's actually pretty nice. And she's like, I bet it is. And like, she does have friends and stuff, but it's hard for her to like make them and keep them. And like, she she's a great fucking mother. I will say that about my sister. She is probably one of the best mothers I know. Granted, like with Sean the first time, she did have postpartum depression. So it was a little rocky the first year, but like, I am very proud of my sister. Man, your family has been through some shit. And I'm very proud of my brother. Yeah. That's, that's a lot. Like, but I'm, I'm glad that I, you know, whenever I talk about authenticity, like one of the big things that comes up for me is self-awareness. And like, I, I've talked to a few different people now on my show who have like late stage diagnosis where they're, you know, they've been into their thirties before they found out that they were autistic or ADHD or, you know, you know, different neurodiversity things. And once they've figured it out, so many different things in their life have, have like kind of started to make sense for me. Like I learned that I was ADHD, like into my, like at the beginning of my college career, but I didn't, it was so long ago that the research wasn't there to understand how that affected me in social situations how it affected my impulse control. It was all just like, oh, so you talk too much and you're late to places. Like that's, that's all I knew was like, this medicine is going to help me not talk so much and not be late all the time. And it did. So I thought I was cured, but I was still awkward as, as fuck. And, you know, lots of different situations whenever I didn't understand what the social cues were like were, I just missed out on stuff. I talked too much. Like I overshared, I was trying to be other things. Yeah. And so like, I, I, I love people who are still trying to find out more about themselves. I know a lot of the times it's, you know, my, my kid is, is not what I expected them to be. Like, let's get them tested. Oh, they, they're this. So let me get tested for this. But I encourage other people who have struggled with any kind of social, you know, social activity to just like get yourself tested and, you know, and make sure that you are, not one of us because if you're having trouble making friends all the time you might be one of us and you're just you're just trying to hang out with the wrong people because we love hanging out with us like if you get yourself a a set of neurodiversity friends all of a sudden everything makes sense and so yeah anyways (laughs) that is true um i was gonna say something (laughs) fuck what was i gonna say I forgot, but um, another thing I will say, like, I was the first person in my family to go to therapy and start seeing somebody, and, like, I was given so much shit for it, but then everybody in my family started going to therapy. Good. Like, not um, not everybody, like, my brother, but, like, my mom started going, my sister started going, my sisters started going, and they're all like, oh, yeah, this mental illness was made up and all this stuff, but, like, Whenever I tell people, it's like, yeah, I was the first person in my family to get help. I was the first person to do this. And I'm like, I was the first person to start cutting bitches off. And everybody's like, that's good. You're breaking the cycle. And everybody keeps saying, break the cycle, break the cycle. But I happened to be watching Game of Thrones at the time. And, like, Daenerys Targaryen kept saying how she was going to break the wheel. We'll break the wheel. And, like, I just kept thinking about it. And everybody was all like, oh, my God, we're so proud of you. You're breaking the cycle. And then I thought about it. And I'm like, well, Daenerys did that, too. And that shit fucking killed her. It drove her crazy. And it fucking killed her. So uh, it's a like she went that. So I so like I was worried about that. And I'm like, great. Yeah, I, I had a oh, I had a, um, a woman on my show. Her name is uh, Marilyn Pennyfeather. And she 
she was talking about like breaking generational cycles. Like she feels like it is her, like she has taken on the mantle to break the general, the, the, the generational cycle of abuse in her family. And she, she, before it is done, she believes it will break her like that. I was like, what do you mean? Like you, you know, like, she's like, yeah, I know that this is going to be something that is going to basically destroy me. And I'm like, maybe, maybe you you shouldn't (laughs) like, maybe I don't, I don't believe that it's necessarily true that you have to be made an example of to break the cycle. Like for one, you talked about it, like, you know, cutting out toxic people from your life or, or at least limiting access to the ability to be able to, to toxify your life. And then also like just being an example and communicating with people in a better way, I think is enough. I don't think you have to like die on the cross to, to break a generational, like, you know, I don't know. What do you think? I hope that's not the case. Um, no, uh, like, and I'm Catholic. So like martyrs, it's all like, yeah, I'm into it. Just kidding. Now. Um, so like I did feel like, cause for the longest time I was trying to be like the glue that held my family together. And then, like, when I started cutting them off, like, I remember they got mad at me specifically, but, like, I did have to step away from my family for, like, a good four years because I did, like, it's like trying to hold, so it's like getting ripped apart by horses, Mm. like, if somebody tied a rope to each end of you, and they just set the horse, yeah, getting quartered. But, like, it was starting to feel like that because I'm getting pulled in one direction, and then, like, I always thought my mom, like, I did have questions and my mom did drive me nuts, but like, she also like pitted me and my brother against mm. our dad, which I get. Cause he was doing some piece of shit stuff at the time, but she made it sound like it was all him. But like, then I just started questioning more and more. And then when it dawned on me, it's like, Oh shit, my mom loves strange men more than her own children. And that like makes you feel a certain kind of way. Cause I told my mom, it's all like, I'm moving and I don't want Brian to come like you can stay with me but I don't want that man in my house and my mom was all like well that's your decision baby I understand and I'm like oh okay so the homeless guy you picked up on the bus you're uh picking him over your own kids and like that made me feel like an extra like special kind of low and like that like also started like tearing apart and i'm like you know what all my family's mean to me and i'm like well they're mean to each other but it's all like i'm actually out here trying like i'm trying to get us along get us to get along i'm trying to be there for people i'm trying and like i like i i was the one who remembered everybody's birthdays and i'd remind everybody like a week and it's like david's birthday's next week don't forget david's birthday's tomorrow don't forget it's david's birthday Just send him happy birthday. That's all you have to fucking do. But I'd like nag everybody and it's all like, hey, make them feel special. Or I'd like buy presents with my money and then write from mom on them. Or I'd have my mom sign them. It's like here. And she's like, oh, thanks for reminding me. And then she's all like, you didn't spend too much money on this one, did you? And I'm like, it's Sarah and she's going to love it. She's like, yeah, but does she really deserve a birthday gift? It's like, it's her fucking birthday mom handed to her. And, like, dude, the shit with her and my sister was insane. But, like, I remember I got my GED and my mom threatened me. She's like, you're going to walk across that stage and get that diploma? Or I'm going to drag your ass up there in a wheelchair? It's like, the choice is yours. And, like, my mom said she wasn't going to go to my sister's wedding. And, like, I went up to my mom and I'm like, Mom, I love you. And she's like, I love you too, baby bear. I'm like, good. Now that we got that out of the way. You're going to go to your daughter's wedding. You're going to have a good time. You're going to be fucking happy for her. You're going to smile in all the photos. And you have two choices. You can walk into that wedding or I can push you in in a fucking wheelchair. And my mom just like looked at me and her eyes got all big. She's like, you can't threaten me. I'm your mother. And I'm like, mom, I'm not threatening you. I'm promising you right now. If you ruin your daughter's special day, I'm going to kick your ass. And, like, that's when I was, like, in my peak martial arts, like, form. Like, I was still fat as hell, but I, I had really good kicks. Um, hey, like, something uh, I've yeah, learned, no, like I, I'm, I'm not a small person. Oh, I'm not a small person. I'm, over, I'm 350 pounds. Like, I am not mobile. But I have seen people much bigger than me 
be able to do a lot of great stuff. Like uh, like the the amount of emphasis we put on size and ability in America is ridiculous. Like it is like the two things are not yeah. nearly as related as we make them in in like our society and I and I really hate it. I am unfortunately one of those people who makes fat people look fat because like I can't do it. Like I, you know, I breathe super deeply whenever I'm trying to tie my shoes and like, I cannot bend over without my back cracking 17 times. I'm out of shape. Like I'm, I'm totally accepting of that. I talk about it on the podcast. It's something that I'm, I'm very aware of. My body image is terrible. My actual shape is even worse. So, but I'm, I don't want you to feel like you have to qualify your martial arts as if I don't believe that you were an ass kicking son of a bitch. Like I believe it. Like if you spend any time getting trained in martial arts, it's, it's something that you, you just get better at. It doesn't matter what size you are. Yeah. Thank God for muscle memory. I think that's the only thing that'll save me in a fight now. (laughs) Uh, I'm like big and like so many fights before doing martial arts. And I felt like, it was like my first week of class and like I kept getting like I'd like st- I'd move in and I'd punch and there was like you're actually doing really good like most people like well most girls like flinch away from it and it's all like but you like you're going into the hits and absorbing them and stuff you're moving out of the way and I'm like thanks I had an abusive childhood so you kind of get used to moving around <laughs> and like the instructor looked at me for a second he's like I don't know how to respond to that and I'm like Sorry, that was probably uh, too much information. And he's like, a little bit, but it's fine. It does explain a lot. But, um, yeah. Wow. I hope I'm okay uh, in a fight. Your story is, it is a tumultuous one. But, like, I like what I want to get into real quick is, did, has it always come honesty? Or, you know, we, we talked about it some, but you putting it all out there on on the Kill Tony show was the reason why everybody like stepped up and was like, Oh, we'll take care of you. Like you talked about like, you know, being steps away from not having a place to live. You talked about all that stuff in front of hundreds of people. I don't know if you thought about it at the time, but millions of people watch it on the podcast. Was it hard for you to like speak about like those really personal things? That part's actually really not that hard for me. Because, like I said, like, I like to make people think and I like to open up a dialogue. And, like, I started off as, like, a blue comic, like, just talking about my sex life. And I started about talking about my home life and people were like, we like dark comedy. And I'm like, I don't know what that is, but thank you. And then, um, but, yeah, no, like, I, my mom used to say, well, it was, like, her little open book. Because, like, also, I guess I have, like, super expressive eyes. <laughs> Mm-hmm. So, like, when I'm, like, scared or nervous, like, my eyes get really big. And, like, my mom didn't mean as an insult because she legitimately loves cows, the animal. Mm-hmm. But she's like, you have such big, beautiful brown cow eyes. Like, they're beautiful with the long lashes. And, like, most people would think that is an insult. But, like, if you ever looked into cow's eyes, they're fucking lovely. Uh, yeah, I see what you're saying. Well, unless they're, like, scared. That shit looks scary. But um, yeah, cow eyes unlike are definitely creepier than horse eyes. Unlike a goats, which are super, super fucking creepy. Have you looked at a goat's eyes? They are creepy. They're square or not square? Dude, I've looked at a goat on rectangular. acid. Yeah. Did you make the dough on acid? Um, yeah, I you... Huh? Did it, were you the oh, reason? Why I said the... I looked at a goat on acid. Oh, you were on acid, not the dough. Yeah. No. <laughs> But I did get a goat drunk one time just to see what would happen. Also, they can't handle light beer. You got to get them a dark ale. Okay. Otherwise, it hurts their tummy. I thought they thought their tummies could handle everything. But um, yeah, I can handle a lot of things. I can definitely handle a notebook that it eats out of your backpack while you're visiting the Phoenix Petting Zoo. My mom straight up punched a cow at the Petting Zoo. <laughs> we were almost asked to leave. <laughs> like. The cow was, like, sitting there, like, rubbing up against my dad and stuff, and my mom went to pet the cow, and the cow turned around and bit her elbow, and my mom didn't like that and turned around and just fucking crossed right to the cow's face. And the cow, like, took a step back. That's how hard my mom Oh, my God. And the cow was just like, what the fuck? And then my dad, he just started laughing, and then, like, 
yes, security guards came. It's all like, you cannot assault a livestock man. <laughs> and then she's like, that bitch started it. <laughs> and, like, my dad talked, <laughs> talked about the situation when we went to go look in the line. <laughs> oh, my gosh. But it does, like, my mom, again, is batshit crazy. And she could fight, too, though. Like, she was big like me and shorter. But she, like, worked in a bakery for, like, 10, 15 years. So, like, she had all this muscle underneath her flab. But that woman, like, I've seen her knock a man's teeth out. And, like, it was funny because they found one of the teeth after she knocked him out. But the next day she's doing dishes and they couldn't figure out where the other tooth was. But she felt feeling a lump on the back of her hand. Well, she was doing dishes and like she worked, like she kept like moving it, and then she saw something white. The dude's tooth got lodged in her hand. Oh my god! So my mom like that is disgusting and yeah, impressive. And she, it is, but like she pulls it out and like right next to the sink is where she kept the jar with her baby teeth. And like she just like took the tooth out, washed it off, and threw it with our baby teeth and added it to her collection. Wow. And she did give me that tooth when I was 15 years old for my birthday. Special relationship. So, yes. uh, like, we're going to start bringing it to a close because we're already like, uh, you know, I this is generally about how long these episodes go. But a lot of comedians yeah. say your that life. Works, I have to pee. <laughs> Good. Yeah, a lot of comedians say your life needs to be messed up to be funny. How do you feel about that? I don't think that's true. Um. I think, like, you can make anything funny. It is easier to laugh at fucked up shit. Um, but, like, Jim Gaffigan, I'm pretty sure, had a decent, normal life. Um, Have you ever heard Jamie Foxx talk about it? Anyway, I don't know a lot about him. Have you ever heard Jamie Foxx talk about how he... Jamie Foxx? He keeps his house, like, at least something broken in his house because he doesn't want to ever lose that frustration with life. He just wants to, like, he always wants to have, like, damn it, this fucking door is messed up, or, like, the dishwasher is broken, or something, because he he never wants to, to get to where his life is doing too good. That's fair, and that actually makes a lot of sense to me. Because, like, I do, like, worry, and I have been stressed out, like, over the Roseanne and the Tony thing. Like, I'm excited for the opportunity, but, like, a lot of good is happening to me right now. And, like, because my life has been the way it is. Sometimes it's my fault. Sometimes it's just circumstance. But I'm worried, like, I'm having too much good right now that something fucked up is going to happen. Well, that's, so, like, I do worry about that's that. That's a whole different fear is, is so, worrying like, that something's going to fucked up is going to happen because yeah. you're enjoying your life right now. I was just saying, like, do you think you need to stay fucked up so <laughs> you can continue being funny? Like, it seems like you've got so much to draw from so. from your from your past that you you can like live a perfectly like incident free life for the rest of your life and you have got plenty to draw from yeah i think so but also i do tend to like i don't know like it's probably not healthy but i do tend to like to be around broken individuals like i like being around people who like have had a hard time or who've been through shit like it's not that i don't want to hang out with people who are like happy and like never had a bad thing happen to them all mm-hmm. the time but it is like nice just kind of like being broken with another person and like being broken together but like comedy clubs are cool but like i would like love i would love to just do shows at bars too because like the people who go to the bars you're not at a bar on a Tuesday because your life's going great. So if I can make that one dude at a bar <laughs> turn around and be all like, hey, that bitch made me laugh. It's like, fuck yeah. Like, I would take making one guy at a bar who's having a bad day laugh over making a room full of 500 happy people laugh. Because I think that's what really does make stand-up and comedy special. So, like, th- that makes me want to ask, is that is that another one of those things where you're a, you're actually afraid of being successful. So you just like opt to want to wanna please like the seven people and like a, a broke down dive bar versus like doing stadiums. Or is that really like, is that really how you feel? I, um, one, it is how I feel, but two, 
I feel bad for saying it, but I don't like comedy clubs. Like, any place that charges you $8 for a Bud Light can go fuck themselves. But, like, the crowds at, like, clubs seem to be a little weird, but also, like, I, like, I'd be down to do theaters. Like, theaters 100%. But also, I'm a little bitter because of the clubs in Arizona. I mean... Because I have, like, I've been told I'm not marketable, and they can't risk me walking the headliner's audience. My jokes are too smart for the room. I need to dumb them down. If I learn to work clean, they could get me work. Shit but like, like that. Who told you that? I'm not going to name their names because uh, I'm not going to. Well, so was this another comedian who was like, man, I could sell you if you would just be stupid like me. Some of them were comics. Some of them were comics. And uh, some of them were just bookers for comedy clubs. And, uh yeah, no, the clubs, like, the only times the clubs would ask me to do their shows was if it was, uh, whatchamacallit, a roast battle or a comedy contest. And, like, most comedy contests, like, the people who, like, book the comedy contest, they already know mm. who they want to win. Mm. Like, there is, like, from the audience and stuff, but there's been, like, so many comedy contests I've done where we're just sitting there and, like, three guys in advance and it's because their friends are the judges and they're just sitting there it's like did you laugh once during his set it's like nope and it's all like fucking bullshit so and that dude here, like, here's, second here's place my in the comedy cents. contest like, you didn't ask for him to give it to you anyways don't dumb your comedy down like i am i am a i am a married I'm man with to. two kids i'm sorry not two kids i've got four kids like i am not your demographic for what you do but i loved it like, I absolutely loved it. Like, if people are going to tell you that there's nobody who wants to hear that stuff, we do. Like, I love, my my childhood was fucked up. Like, my my relationship with my family is is terrible. So I appreciate all that stuff. And, like, Louis C.K. said it best for me is that he wants to take us to places that feel unsafe at any other time. Take us there and make us laugh so we're okay about it. Like, so you talking about your yeah. like dark childhood and like, you know, fighting with your sister and like, I, I, I identify with all that stuff. Like me and my brother, best friends most of the time, but we still fought as well. Like he beat me up all the time. Like that, that was normal for me. So hearing those kinds of jokes, because I can't, I can't write a joke like that. Hearing somebody else make a joke like that. I'm like, damn, that is especially funny. And I really, really appreciate you doing what you're doing. And I hate that there are people out there telling you that you need to change it in order to be successful. In today's in today's world, with the access that we have, once you find your audience, you're going to blow up. Like, I have no doubt about it that you are going to blow up as long as you do your best to stay out of your own way and, like, and capitalize on the, on the success. You're going to be you're yeah. going to be just as big as any any other Internet comedian, if not bigger. So. Yeah. I'm working um, on it. Is there anything I didn't ask you about today that you want to talk about? Yes, the NASA dolphin experiments. What? I just want the world to that, know. That sounds like something I need to NASA, know about. What? <laughs> it's something everybody needs to know about. There was just a point in our country's time where NASA gave researchers a lot of money to pump dolphins full of LSD to try and teach them how to talk. So, we, like, the train of thought was if we could figure out how to talk to another intelligent animal on this planet, we'd be able to talk to intelligent life outside the planet. Which I get that, but they had three dolphins and one of them was a boy dolphin and two were girl dolphins, but they'd like keep them separate. But the do boy dolphin was, to quote the researcher, a budding adolescent. Okay, so where this goes is the head researcher, because it was too time consuming to move the boy dolphin back to the female dolphins to quench no. his thirsts and his needs. It was just faster if she took care of it herself. So this bitch was straight up just jerking off dolphins in the name of science. What? But like the like the story like Hustler found out about it and did a story and then NASA pulled the recent funding because they like got found out. It's all like, hey, we agreed to give the dolphins drugs. We didn't say shit about sexually pleasing them. And like just the whole like, when, just look it up. Just type in dolphin. When was this? <laughs> it happened in like the nineteen sixties or nineteen oh seventies. Like I want to say the sixties or seventies. It was like right before the drug war on drugs. And I'm like, okay, 
it's all like, I think they just gave all the LSD to the dolphins and they don't want to tell us. Oh my god, that's ridiculous. But, but yeah, that shit really happened. Like, I'm telling, like, whenever I have extra time on stage, I bring it up. Because I think people should know. Because, <laughs> it, like, it just makes my day. And I'm like, okay, so we can't take drugs, but you'll pay for the dolphins to take the drugs. But also, it turns out LSD doesn't work on oh, dolphins. So then, so the so it was ultimately just yeah. a total freaking waste to do the whole research, all of it. I mean, except for yeah. that one dolphin who had a great time. Yeah, he did. But once she got fired and they got separated, he missed the human. So he swam to the bottom of the tank. Are and you killed himself. serious? His name was Peter the dolphin. Damn, dolphins are so yeah. like they're so human. Like, or or we're so dolphin. However, they're hardcore. Like. That's wild. Yeah. I didn't know that dolphins could commit suicide. That's depressing, but also amazing. Yeah. And the thing, what is more depressing and amazing about it? So dolphins are different than humans in the sense we don't have to think about breathing in and out. Mm. We just do it. Every time a dolphin takes a breath, it's a conscious effort. They switch from, like, I think the left to the right side of their brain, like, in, out. But they have to think every breath is they it take, because... which is why they don't really sleep. <sighs> Is that both above and underwater? That's wild. That that's like some So like when dolphins kill themselves, they go down and literally just hold their breath. They can't just drown drown. Whoa. Like they actually have to stay down there and like force it. Dude, that is that's wild. That is really, really wild. Yeah. Ooh. What do the next few months look like for you? Um I now I have the Hinchcliffe show on the 18th. I'm doing a show in Midland, Texas, October 27th. Uh, I completely dipped into my savings for this because it's a really good friend and I've never been. So I just thought I'd take the opportunity. I bought tickets to go to New York to do my friend's show out there. Yeah. So I'm doing a show November 5th in New York at Brooklyn Art House, I think it's called. So I got to do a show out there. Um, I'm actually doing another show at a place called Pirates Den the same night I'm in town with Tony. So I'm going to do that show first and then go to the CD dive bar and do a set there too. And um, so I've got all that. Um, there is a gentleman who's talking to me about doing a five city tour in Texas. So I got to figure out how much to charge for that. Cause like he was asking my friend Hector what my rates were for the show. I'm like, I don't fucking know. I'm used to being painted drink tokens. It's like, I don't know how to put a price on Just, like, like, I'm going to tell you this because they are asking for you set, like, ask for more than you think that you're worth. Like, and if they say no, then come down after that. Okay. But ask, like, start high and work down because okay. so many creatives, like performers, so many people undervalue the fact that somebody came to you to ask for your services. Oh, you disappeared. Yeah. I lost your picture, but I just okay, as long as I can still hear, we're good. I I, I know it's still recording. Uh, it's just like local. So okay. um yeah, I that that's exciting. I hope that they that's right. I hope that, that pans out and I hope that you get paid more than you think that you could. Like that would be awesome. And um I was listening to uh Matt Reif and uh Tom Segura on Two Men One Cave or Two Bears One Cave and they were talking about routing. So this is something I'd never heard of before. But while you're in New York, try to do some other shows. Like since you're dipping in your savings, like make, make a time out of it and do like get as, get on as many places you can down there because who knows you might pop off there as well because you are really, really funny. Um, I am excited for that. Um, also like, I don't know how familiar you are with Skank Fest. Not at all. Um, it's like one of the largest comedy festivals in the world. Um, I did the naked roast there this past, this last time in September. And I was like, I was officially on Skankfest last year, and that was like the proudest moment of my life because it was the first time I was accepted by a festival. Okay. Where like the booker saw me and they're like, yeah. And like, I didn't realize how selective the process was, but like, I think they said out of like a thousand something submissions, they only pick like 90 people. Wow. And I happened to be one of them. And um, I was super proud of that. And then I got to do the naked roast while I was there because, like, I was already on. And I'm like, can I do it if I'm already on the lineup? And they're all like, we'll ask. And they're like, yeah, how do you feel about roasting a porn star? And I'm like, I'm down. So I got to roast Evan Stone, who is like one, 
like he has a huge like lifetime porn star career like he's been doing it since like the late 70s wow. he was in pirates which was like the biggest budgeted budgeted porn film ever made but i roasted him and he did not age well but he's still doing porn oh, no. and it's funny but now he's like in gilf porn so the grandfather i'd oh, like to God. Fuck, or step granddad or whatever <laughs> yeah but like i remember i was writing rose for him but i was just watching his porn for three hours straight trying to think of insults but like all of it was actually like pretty funny and like tasteful and it wasn't rapey at all and like my friend was taking a nap and I take my headphones out and I'm like, I don't think I can roast him. All this porn has been consensual and I didn't even know that was an option. And he and my friend Hector just started laughing at me. He's like, You're an idiot. And he went back to sleep. Did you just like try to like go after him for his technique or something? Or like, you know, the way that you were supporting your back in that one position, like I don't know what else you would make fun of them for. Well, like he has long hair and like his skin's leathery now. He does have a huge penis. Um sorry. <laughs> Well, he's a porn star. That's a given. Uh, like, wow. um, now that he's older, like he has long hair, but he like his face is a little busted. But the first one, it's like give it up for Evan Stone. He looked like Caitlyn Jenner before it was cool, <laughs> and that got a huge pop. <sighs> and then the other one is like I think the hardest part about writing roast for you was finding a VHS player to watch your films. <laughs> Which I like that we're both up here naked, but you still look like you bought your outfit at Goodwill. That is awesome. I had like two more, but I don't remember what they are. But like he didn't roast me back. He was just rolling on shrooms and he was just telling street jokes. And like by his third or fourth joke, the audience started booing him. And I'm like, shit. But everybody, it's all like, you, you were fucking great. Evan Stone sucks. That's hilarious. And I'm like, okay. Well, I want to, I want to ask, like, you don't, you don't have to but do it. Super nice but would you want to do one minute of uninterrupted comedy? Yeah. I would, I would love to have this kill Tony moment and just All let right. you do one minute of in uninterrupted comedy on authentic on air, not kill Tony. All right. You want me to start now, or I'll wait till and... the whole timer. Hold on. I, I will. Oh, I'll have a uh, a clapping noise whenever your one minute is up, and then a drum roll whenever you've actually like the west hollywood bear but not at all so and okay that's fair you can More start at 20 so ready set <clears throat> go you all ever do like nasty stuff when you're a kid um here's what mine was me and my brother had a booger collection and like we knew it was wrong and like essentially it was us just picking our nose and wiping against the wall between our bunk bed and like we kept it hidden from our mom but she finds it one day and loses her mind and just starts pointing at it and she's like look look at it look at it and me and my brother are like yeah that's why we have it and like my mom's biggest thing was look if you guys want to be pieces of shit at home or act like animals at home that's fine but as far as the rest of the world is concerned i'm a good fucking mother and you're good fucking kids this was the exception after the booger wall she marched us door to door like registered sex offenders and made us tell everybody what we did which looking back now upsets me because i have actual sex offenders in my family and they didn't have to do that shit and uh yeah the story ends with her taking us to a priest and the priest looked at us like look my children putting boogers on the wall in itself is not a sin but you definitely made jesus <laughs> sad that's that was perfect timing that was one minute of comedy from celia Contreras. Celia, I have had a great time talking to you today. I hope that you've enjoyed the experience as well. Where can I people find it. you online and uh, find out more about you if they're interested? All right. So I do have a lot of like podcasts that are like starting to pop up now, but um, like a guest on them and I'll post links for that. Just look me up, Celia Contreras on Facebook. Sometimes it's hard to find me. Sometimes I pop up right away. It's definitely easier to find me on Instagram, which is... Celia, C E L I A underscore A underscore Graham, G R A M. Like I'll sell you a gram. And um, yeah. And if you just type in my name, Celia Contreras Comedy, on either TikTok or YouTube, my YouTube channel will pop up. All right. Thank you for being such a great guest and being honest and vulnerable with your story. <laughs> there is a lot of information there that I think that a lot of people will identify with. So I think that, 
you have huge things coming in your future if you stay the course and keep using your story as a powerful thing to make people laugh and to connect with them. And I am so appreciative that I got the chance to connect with you. <clears throat> so. I am too. I'm Thank glad you, you reached out. Uh, if you enjoyed today's episode, please leave a review. I really appreciate the feedback and it helps me get heard by more listeners. Follow this podcast so you get get updates about new episodes and live streams. If you are interested in bonus or behind the scenes content, go check out the Authentic on Air with Bruce Alexander Patreon page. Share this episode with someone you think might enjoy it right now. Check out earlier episodes to support the future creation of great content. And don't forget to like at Authentic Identity Management on Instagram, Facebook, Threads, and LinkedIn. You can also head over to the Authentic YouTube, or sorry, the Authentic Bruce YouTube channel for podcast video and impactful clips from my conversations with these amazing guests. Finally, if you are struggling to show up as yourself in your content, your work, your life, or your family, I would love to help you. <clears throat> Authentic Identity Management does identity and authenticity coaching to help you align your true self with the identity you share with the world. It is exhausting to live someone else's life. Live authentically and access the potential that belongs only to you. You can contact me on social or email bruce at authenticidentitymanagement.com to set up a free 30-minute consultation to help you get started living your authentic life. That is it for today's episode. Thank you for listening. Until next time, be yourself and love yourself. Bye, everyone. <laughs>